my dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Jehovah, for allowing us to come here to your house of worship safely. Thank you for taking care of us throughout the night and throughout the week. And Father, I now ask that you um, speak through me and you help me express myself the way that you would like to for your people to hear. I pray that you be with my thoughts and that I speak only your word and your word alone. I thank you and I ask you these things in the name of Jesus, your precious son. Amen. Uh, well, once again, happy Sabbath. I really didn't know what to uh, title this uh, presentation, but nevertheless, um, I gave it the title, The King of the North and the War over Jerusalem. There's a war over Jerusalem going on today. As a matter of fact, this war has been going on for hundreds of years. Does, does the Bible shed any light on this topic? Before I knew about all this, I had no clue that the Bible actually shed light on this very topic, but it does. Is it important for us to know I believe it is. I believe it is very important for us to know. And when we conclude or I conclude my study, you will know why it's very important, vital for us to know. Daniel 11.45 and Daniel 12.1 tells us that when the king of the north places his tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, Michael will stand up. And what does that mean when Michael stands? That means that human probation is forever close. That means that your destiny and mine is forever fixed. There's no more. So that's why I believe it's important, but we're going to look at this more in, in detail. The woes and the Ottoman Turk, for those who have studied prophecy, will know that the woes are a symbol of the Turks. There's three woes in the scriptures. And we, that was our opening text. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. When I first read this verse many years ago, I read three angels. And I thought that this, that this was referring to the messages in Revelation chapter 14. But these are not the angels of Revelation chapter 14. As a matter of fact, it's a connection. It's just an, it's an, another group of angels. When we speak of the third angel's message, we normally think Revelation 14, 6 down to verse 12. But... In my humble opinion, that's not the third angel's message. It is only a portion of the third angel's message. Why do I say that? Because Revelation chapter 14, 6 reads, And I saw another angel. What does that imply? That there was others, right? Before that one. There was other angels. And in this case, the angels of the trumpets, the angels of the woes. It's all one package.
And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Revelation is full of symbols. All through the book of Revelation. And a star is a symbol of what? Do you recall that in Jesus' hands there are how many stars? Seven stars, correct? And these are what? They're the ministers or the elders of the congregations. Also, the stars also symbolize angels, correct? How many third part of the stars did Satan bring with him? That's referring to literal angels. But we also have the three angels movement that is presented by three angels flying in the midst of heaven. We know that those are not three literal angels, but in fact, a a representation of a movement. Correct? So in this case, a star or an angel is a symbol for a messenger. But it's not just any messenger. It's one that is said to had fallen unto the earth. And not only that, but it was given the key to the bottomless pit. Revelation 9, verse 2, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke, a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Uh, Here's an Symbology as well. Who is the son of righteousness? Christ Jesus, correct? And what does this smoke do? What does it do? Or what does it cause? It causes to darken the light of the sun. Not only that, but it also mentions the air. What is there? What does there do? Is wind, correct? In my understanding, it could be also the darkening of the working of God's Holy Spirit. And this was caused by this power. Next verse. And there came out of the smoke locusts. What are locusts? Locusts. Grasshoppers, correct? Upon the earth... And unto them was given given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now locusts can quickly multiply. And these run in bands. That's how grasshoppers work. In other words, no leader leads them. But we're going to know that this power will change. And to them it was given that they should not kill them. Notice. But that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was, that, was as a torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. I found out, I find this very interesting because the scorpion is used to refer to this power. And I have found one interesting characteristic of the scorpion. In many cases, a scorpion is suicidal. Did you know that? When it sees itself without an escape and he knows that his life is in danger, he inflicts himself, he stabs himself in the head, and he dies. It's interesting because the power that we're referring to, they're suicidal as well. Um, I have a small clip showing this, illustrating this. So I asked for permission. (laughs) Permission was granted me. Uh, So... I'm going to show you just a small, small clip of what scorpion 
does with this venom once he, or what he does to himself. Let me see if this, okay. see the scorpion is there, trap, has no way out. And so he figures that he needs to take himself out. And I found that very interesting because a scorpion symbolizes this particular power. And the locusts, I'm sorry, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. Interesting characteristics here. But notice something else is added. Now we see horses added to the picture. Revelation chapter 9, verse 8 reads, And they had hair as the hair of woman, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Don't let their long hair fool you. These men are warriors. There's nothing feminine about these men. Now notice Revelation 19.10. Also, they have tails with stingers like what? Like scorpions. And in their tails is their authority to hurt the people for five months. What's in their tail? They're stingers, right? But it also mentions that in their tails is their what? Authority. Why is there authority found in the tail? Spiritually speaking. Authority means someone that has the command, right? The commands and the, and the rest follow those commands. Well, who does this power follow? Whose commands does this power follow? Notice, Isaiah 9.15, the ancient and honorable, he is the head and the prophet that teaches what? He is the tail. Does this power have a prophet who teaches lies? That's their authority. They follow their command. So again, what lies in the tail? False instruction. The prophet that teaches lies. Here's another interesting point. And they had a king over them. Now we come to this passage of scripture where we are told that they had now have a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So notice a change takes place. Now the Bible reads that they have a king over them. Under this king, their work changes from torture to actually killing their enemies. The next statement is taken from Uriah Smith. Notice what he penned. Is Uriah Smith, Daniel in the Revelation, page 478, paragraph 5. They had a king over them. From the death of Muhammad until near the close of the 13th century, the Mohammedans were divided into various factions under several leaders, with no general civil, civil government extending over them all. Near the close of the 13th century, Othman founded a government which has, been, which has since been known as the Ottoman government, or empire, extending over all the principal Mohammedan tribes, consolidating them into one grand monarchy. 
So what brought them together in this statement? A king. And I believe from what my eyes see today, the same exact thing is taking place. There's one individual who is uniting Islam today because they're divided. And it's interesting that this one individual as well is a king or a head of a nation. We're going to see some images here from early prophetic charts in Adventism. Notice uh, the imagery here. This chart was known as the 1843 chart, and it was published by Joshua V. Himes, or put together, I believe, by him, a Millerite preacher. Notice the bottom right-hand corner. What do you see there? You see the Mohammedans. What are they riding on? Horses. Now they have that, like the crown, right? On their head. And you're going to see, or well, you can't really see, but these are the wolves. And they involve the Saracens and the Turks as well. And this was believed to be the Mohammedans, the religion of Islam and the Ottoman Empire as their lead or leader. We have another chart here. Here's the 1850 chart. Notice we still have the three, the two horses there, and then we have the angels, and we have the announcement, whoa, whoa, whoa. So we have the Ottoman supremacy, which seized in um, 1840 to 1844. And we have a Quite a bit of details there. But again, the point I'm trying to show you is that the understanding of early Adventism was that the wolves refer or point it to the Turk or to Islam. We have another one here. This is the 1863 chart. We see the same. You see the horses there by the Mohammedans. This was published, like I said, in the year 1863. And this is not a chart, what I'm going to show you next. But this is very interesting. And it was taken um, during the protests on Gaza, or in Gaza, June the 8th of 2018. Notice that. I added the other horsemen there. That's mine. But... <laughs> But the image is the original, the one with the man riding on his horse with the Turkish flag. That's an original image. It seems to me by this current image that the Turk hasn't forgotten his history. Have we forgotten ours? This was also taken from the same site. I can give you the sites. Uh, I just screenshot a lot of these images, but I can share with my, the sources where I got this information from. Muhammad saw his miss, mission as an extension of the Abrahamic traditions of Judaism and Christianity. Therefore, the first Qibla, or direction in which Muslims should pray, was Jerusalem. Today, Muslims bow towards Mecca. In addition, Islamic tradition predicts that Jerusalem will play an important role in the future, naming it as one of the cities where the end of the world will be played out. I find that quite amazing that they say they believe this. Though the world doesn't appear to be ending there right now, Trump's announcement was, has increased tensions in the region. The president's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital drew praise from Israeli, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and condemnation from the Palestinian allies who worried that this move would make it more difficult to negotiate a long-sought peace treaty between the states. And in fact, hours before Trump's announcement, the Palestinian general delegate to the UK 
stated that if the U.S. president recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, he would effectively be declaring war. Some of these names I cannot pronounce. Inez Mesera relates that the Prophet Muhammad said, what did he say? This matter, the caliphate, or the sultan, the leader, will be after me in Medina, then in Al-Sham, then in the peninsula, then in Iraq, then in the city, Constantinople or Istanbul today, then in Beit ul Magdis which is Jerusalem. If it is in Beit ul Magdis, which is Jerusalem, its home country is there, and no people will be able to remove it, so it will return to them forever. So in other words, it's a prediction that Jerusalem will return to Islam. This blessed city belongs to Allah, and He has given it to, given it to the last Ummah, the Muslim Ula to rule with justice. Moses said to his people, Seek help in Allah and be set steadfast. The earth belongs to Allah. He bequeaths it to any of his slaves he wills. The successful outcome is for those who have taqwa. And of course, there's a reference there which I can't read. Jerusalem is the capital of the future caliphate. And this was taken from uh, the caliphateonline.com. From that very day till today, according to the Israeli newspaper, Israel Hayom, approximately 63 million US dollars were channeled via Turkish NGOs and the Turkish government to Palestinian organizations for the defense and support of Muslim culture to promote and enhance the Muslim character and identity of Jerusalem, so as to further establish the Turkish presence and influence in the city, as claimed and supported by the Arad Shiva website, in order to undermine tensions. Israel knew everything all along, and from the first, and I'm sorry, and from the first instance, still up until 2010, that is up until Mavi Marma incident. Israel and Turkey were close allies. Within this relationship framework, Erdogan held a free hand so that he could funnel his Muslim charity and charitable work towards the Palestinians. When President Erdogan revealed his true intentions to the government of Israel in 2010, the result was immediate disruption and se severance of diplomatic ties and relations for six whole years between the two countries, but by then, he had time to set up support networks in Jerusalem and Gaza with very support of the Muslim Brotherhood. So he knows what he's after, right? Erdogan knows what he wants. Recep Tayyip Erdogan has, has from the very first day that he took up the prime minister's office, taken up the role of the protector of the Palestinian people, and he is thought by many to have succeeded. Still, for the first time, he openly stated claims on Jerusalem, and especially on the Temple Mount, where in ancient times the Jewish holy temple could be found on which ground? The Muslim shrines of the Dome of the Rock and of the Al-Aska Mosque are and when at the beginning of October for over four days lent 50 Islamic organizations all closely connected to the Muslim Brotherhood met in Istanbul to discuss about the dangers that the al Aska Mosque is facing Israel. In other words, he called a summit for all these Islamic leaders to come and talk about how they're going to deal with this issue. He's the one, he's, if I could use this term, he's the Pope of Islam. He's placing himself there, and the people are embracing him as such. Among the main participants and speakers was the vice president of the AKP party, uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's party, Yassin Akte, who called for joint Muslim action among brothers because 
If Al Askamask is in danger and in perilous condition, then the whole of humanity is in danger. Did you catch that? If that place is in danger, then all humanity is in danger. And at risk, since Al Quds, Jerusalem, stands as the only example of coexistence between different people and religions. It is imperative that we have to know that the recognized keeper and guardian of the Christian and the Muslim religious sites in Jerusalem is the standing, of king, standing king of Jordan. The standing monarch, King Abdullah II of Jordan, is married to Queen Rania of Jordan, whom is of Palestinian origin, and the king himself is considered to be a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad of the 43rd generation, claiming to be the keeper and guardian of the sites. Erdogan does not only try to meddle in Israel's eternal affairs, but to those of the entire Arab world, by arguing against the very standing, both political and religious, of one of the prophet's blood relatives who reigns over not just the Jordanian people, but also of the Palestinian people. So they have close connections or close relations in that area there. The Israelis seem to have, of course, full knowledge and insight of Erdogan's plans regarding Jerusalem, plans which they shared through the publication of the Israel Hayam on 21st of June. Turkish institutions and organizations are channeling, channeling millions of U.S. dollars to, instir, to Eastern Jerusalem and the Temple Mount area in, a, in an attempt to bolster Turkey's diplomatic and political position and relation to being the main Muslim element and power in Jerusalem, as stated in the Israel Hayam article, which is based on the rather extensive and detailed report. Some of the funds were transferred via Taika, Turkish Corporation and Coordination Agency, a government agency under the direct control of Dr. Serdo Kam, a close associate of President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Israeli journalist Nadav Shragai, in an option article published in the Israel Hayam, entitled The Neutralization Turkish Influence, refers to the unholy tri triad of Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Sheikh Raid Shalak, and the former Grand Mufti in Krimai Shampuri, who fantasizes about the creation of an Islamic caliphate in the region having Jerusalem as its basis. Turkish funds, he has argued, continue to be directed, directed directly to the Temple Mount so as further weaken the proposition over control and dominance of Israel in Jerusalem and as to further enhance Islam's role in the city and especially at Temple Mount, which according to the article's editor, is the holiest site for Jerusalem, but merely the third holiest site for Islam. In this article, the editor is suggesting ways and means to counter Turkey's economy, economic influence and penetration to the holy city by making references to a Recep Tayyip Erdogan's vision for the revival and reestatement of the Ottoman Empire in Jerusalem. So do we see what's taking place? Now, our forefathers, and when I say our forefathers, I'm referring to the Adventist pioneers. They refer to this question as the Eastern question. That's how they refer to this very, these events taking place in the Middle East. What is the Eastern question? Uriah Smith penned the following. Notice what he said. What is the Eastern question? It is not easy to give a definition. For to the Russia or Russian, it may mean one thing, to France, another. And to Austria, still another. But sifted of every side issue, it may be reduced to this. The driving of the Turk into Asia and a scramble for his territory. So the 
Eastern question may be reduced to this. To the driving out of, to the driving of the Turk into Asia, out of Europe. Did Mrs. White knew about the Eastern question? Have you ever read anything that Alan White said about the Eastern question? Notice, Elder Daniel speaks this evening upon what? The Eastern question. May the Lord give his Holy Spirit to inspire the hearts to do what? To make the truth plain. I share this with someone. Well, I don't know if I should share that. Well, I already started. But he understood that, well, it's just like we often do. We pray, but we don't know what the speaker is going to talk about. We pray that the truth can be made plain. And oftentimes what comes from the platform is not truth, but error. But I don't believe that was the case with Sister White. She knew what the Eastern question was. And nevertheless, she says that she prayed. And her desire was that the Lord will give his spirit or his Holy Spirit to Elder Daniels in order for him to make the truth plain. Here's another quote from Ellen White. Sunday morning, the weather was still cloudy. But before it was time for the people to assemble, the sun shone forth. Boats and trains poured their living fright upon the ground in thousands. Elder Smith spoke in the morning upon the Eastern what? Question. The subject was of special interest, and the people listened with the most earnest attention. In the afternoon, it was difficult to make my way to the desk through the standing crowd. Upon reaching it, a sea of heads was before me. The mammoth tent was full, and thousands stood outside, making a living wall several feet deep. Were these people interested in listening to what was taking place? Yes, they were. And as a matter of fact, the world, and to be more specific, I would say, the Christian world, their eyes is in the Middle East. So the world is looking upon these events. My lungs and throat pain me very much, yet I believe that God will help me upon this important occasion. While speaking, my weariness and pain were forgotten as I realized that I was speaking to a people that did not regard my words as idle tales. The discourse occupied over an hour, and the very best attention was given throughout. As the closing hymn was being sung, the officers of the Temperance Reform Club in Haverhill solicited me, as on the previous year, to speak before their, associa their association on Monday evening, having an opportunity to speak at Danvers. I was obliged to decline the invitation. The Eastern Question. Now notice this article from the BBC News. Turkey. The Eastern Question, what does it say? It's back. So the world knows. They know what's, what's on the horizon. They can see it. They don't study the prophecies, but they know history. And they know what's playing out. Erdogan, what does it say? Liberate Jerusalem from whom? From whom? Over here on the bottom it says, Conquest is Mecca, Conquest is Saladin. It's to hoist the Islamic flag over Jerusalem again. Conquest is the heritage of Mehmed II, and conquest means, force, means forcing Turkey back on its feet, said Erdogan, in a speech on Saturday in Istanbul, before millions who appeared to celebrate 562 years since the Turks captured Constantinople from European Christians. They're very familiar with their history. 
And I know, because I've read, and I don't have that article with me, but President Erdogan believes that he's the next sultan. Recep Tayyip Erdogan is trying to make Jerusalem his own city, and for that, he will spare no money nor hardship. Turkish President Erdogan calls on all Muslims to protect Jerusalem, Jerusalem holy site, known as Temple Mount and Noble Sanctuary. You see who's taking the lead in all these things in relation to Jerusalem for Islam? It's this man here. Turkish President Erdogan, Muslims lost their way to where? To Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, in, his, in, a, in a speech, he mentioned, literally, that we, referring to the um, Islamic world, we have lost our focus. Our focus is Jerusalem. Calling for Islam to once again unite. Scimitar wielding Turkish governor vows to conquer Jerusalem. Notice what he says. A Turkish regional governor, la governor last weekend declared while wielding a double-bladed scimitar above his head, as a though that sword, that type of sword, was used by the Turks. So this is what he's waving above his head. That Turkey's forces would soon march into Jerusalem and other cities in the Middle East. Ne Nekati Sinturk, the government appointed governor of the Kersir province, raised eyebrows with a speech from the balcony of the governor's office as Turkish troops were poised to take the Syrian city of a friend from the Kurdish militia. God willing, we will take a friend. We will take Man Manbi, he said in videos posted on Turkish news websites referring to another Kurdish house city in Syria, waving a sword known locally as the Sulf Sulfikar above his head with one hand and holding a megaphone in another, he added, we will also go to Mosul and we will go to Jerusalem, God is greatest. The Turkish sultans controlled both the Iraqi city of Mosul and the holy city of Jerusalem for long periods during the Ottoman Empire. The Sovokar is a double-bladed scimitar of the king used of the of the kind used by Islamic warriors in the early conquest. Such a sword is said to have been given by the Prophet Muhammad to his son-in-law, the Prophet Ali. On Thursday, several days after he made the speech, and a day it began circulating in the media, reports said Sinturk had gone into retirement. It was not immediately clear, clear to what extent his retirement on age grounds had been pre-planned or forced by his incendiary speech. But Senator uh, Kershaw, governor for the last three and a half years, said he was unrepentant. In terms of fatherland and language, I have no fear. He was quoted as saying by the Dogen News Agency, all good things must come to an end. When a person is at the top, they must know how to step down. And going out at the peak is most Aspicuous, auspicious. Top Iranian general Islamic army in Syria waiting orders to do what? Now the following is very, um, I don't see how this can actually take place and it, it, it's not being, well, I guess we can understand why it's not in the media. But this is taken from my paper in, in Turkey. And this is what, when that summit took place, you know what one of the things was discussed? How to eradicate or eliminate or take, take the Jews from Jerusalem. That was in their summit. That's one of the topics they, they touched on. You're gonna, I'm going to show you an image of, of this particular um, 
um, paper they gave out. Um, trying to think of another term, but notice what this says. It says, introduction on December 12, 2017, ahead of, ahead of the summit of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation in Istanbul, the Turkish daily Yenik Savak, which is close to President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his ruling AKP party, published an article titled, A Call for Urgent Action, which also appeared in the paper's, paper's website under the title, what if an army of Islam was formed against Israel? Interesting. The article called on the 57 member states of the OIC to form a joint army of Islam to besiege and attack the state of Israel. It notes that such a joint army will greatly exceed the Israeli, Israeli, Israeli army in manpower, equipment, and budget and presents statistics to prove this. Or it presented, I'm sorry, or it presents. It, is all, it also advocates establishing joint bases for the army, army's ground, air, and naval forces that will arrive from all over the Muslim world to besiege Israel, while n noting that Pakistan, as the early nuclear country, has a special status among the OIC countries. And an interactive map provides, here's the map I'm going to show you here, an interactive map provides information on, mil on military forces stationed in various locations and the role they can play in the potential joint Muslim attack on Israel. And here's this map. Notice, the red is Israel, Palestine, Jerusalem. And you see all the military equipment there, tanks and jets. And they all have their target on Jerusalem. The pioneers. I'm going to share a few quotes of the pioneers. What did the early SDA believe and teach regarding this question? Notice, Uriah Smith, Daniel, and the Revelation, page 370. But if Turkey, now occupying the territory which constituted the northern division of Alexander's empire, is not the king of the north of this prophecy, then we are left without any principle to guide us in the interpretation. And we presume all will be agreed that there is no room for the introduction of any other power here. In other words, they knew, they believed that the power that was north of Jerusalem was Turkey. And of course, off of the studies, of course, of um, Revelation chapter 9. This is A.T. Jones, The Marshalling of the Nations, page 3031. So, when we come to the 40th verse of the 11th of Daniel, we are not reading of affairs of way back in the days of the empire of Greece, nor of the affairs of Rome, but of affairs down here at the time of the end. What year is the time of the end? 1798. So he's referring to events here in our time, at the time of the end, as mentioned in the 35th verse. Other verses also show the same thing. And bear in mind that the king of the south is always in Egypt, and the king of the north is always the power occupying the territory of which Constantinople is the center. And of all the world, and all the world knows that since 1453 A.D., the territory of which Constantinople is the center has been held and ruled by the Turks. Then the king of the north at the time of the end is the Turkish dominion. That's the power that's reigning in the north. So therefore, that power is the king of the north. Here's Haskell. Every eye is centered on that one spot and has been for years. Nothing's new under the sun, right? Turkey is known universally as a sick man of the East. And the only reason he does not die is because intoxicants are administered, figuratively speaking, by this one nation, then another. The time will come when he will remove from Constantinople and take up his abode in Palestine. That is plant his tabernacle 
between the Mediterranean and Red Seas. Time and again, the world has been brought to realize that the end of all things is near at hand. For all know that when the Turk steps out of Constantinople, there will be a general breaking up of Europe. They may not name this impending conflict the Battle of Armageddon, but God has so named it. So there's a war or a battle that's going to be fought there. And according to the name that God has given it, it's the Battle of Armageddon. Something very interesting, I find, that before Jesus entered the Holy of Holies on October 22, 1844, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. And right before Jesus finishes his work in the Holy of Holies, again we see the Turk. But now we see him moving his government to Jerusalem. I'm sorry? Right. Yeah. So we see the Turk at the beginning, or the Ottoman Empire, and we see him at the end. Notice this. This treaty was signed, and the ultimatum was officially put in the power of Muhammad Ali on August 11, 1840. Since that time, Turkey has been known everywhere as the sick man of the East. Daniel prophesied concerning him, saying, He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between, between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. At any moment, when the jealous powers of Europe can decide, either peaceably or in battle, whether they negotiate this or they fight, which one of them shall occupy Constantinople, the sick man will speedily take his departure from Europe. That movement, for, for which nations are now on the alert, will be the sign of still more important changes in the heavenly court. There were signs or events that showed the early Advent movement, the movings of our high priest. Of course, they didn't have all the light as they believe that the sanctuary was the earth. But nevertheless, again, we see this power come to the scene. So likewise, or in a similar matter, before Jesus concludes his work in the Holy of Holies, what event is foretold to occur? Notice, the importance of the prophecy and the exactness with when which it was fulfilled to the very day shall lead to a careful investigation of that divine history which circles about the years 1840 to 1844. Its study will lead men to look for changes in the heavens as well as upon earth. For when the capital of Turkey is removed to Palestine, then Christ, finishing his work in the sanctuary, throws his censer on the earth as a signal for the final dissolution of all things. When does probation close? When this event takes place. Not at the Sunday law, as I used to believe, or any other event, but rather when the Turk removes his capital, or moves his capital, rather, to Palestine. The period of our world will be short. The interest in Daniel and the Revelation, this is Alan White referring to Uriah Smith's book, is to continue as long how long? As long as probationary time shall last. Has probation ended? So then we should be still teaching from that book. If we would obey the prophet, because there's another statement where she says that this book should be given to our students who are studying to become successful students of the prophecies. Can you imagine if that book was given in our schools? What our pastors, our ministers would be teaching today? They would be teaching the truths of the past. Amen. Not one of them would have changed. 
God used the author of this book as a channel through which to communicate light to direct minds to the truth. Shall we not appreciate this light, which points us to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our King? In 1919, how many are familiar with that year? 1919, the following was said. And this was, it was said because there was, this view was challenged as well as others. In the year 1919, notice what was, what was said. There is a danger that the spirit of unrest in the religious world will possess our hearts, and that in our study we shall, make, we shall mistake idle speculation and mere theorizing for divine revelation. Hence, we should be very certain that our conclusions are well-founded before we sweep aside positions which have stood the test of long years and the closest scrutiny of the enemies of this movement, and substitute in their place expositions which are but the result of comparatively short and superficial study. We see no reason at the present time for departing from the view we have held for years regarding exposition of Daniel 11. We have seen no new interpretation which in our judgment is superior to the old. We believe that the conclusions held by us from the beginning of this movement, that Turkey is represented, represented by the term King of the North in the prophecy is correct. And because just, as, and because just at the, this present time, juncture in the affairs of this world, there seems to be no immediate prospect that Turkey will plant her palaces in Jerusalem, is no reason why we should change our view in the, of the question. If we cannot see, then it is best to wait and, buy, and bid God's time for, the, for fuller light and watch him work things are around as we believe his word reveals that he will. Amen. So in other words, well, we don't see, Prior to 2001, I never heard of Islam. I don't know about you, but that was my experience. It was after 9-11. And I started hearing about Islam. And I started hearing preachers preaching about Islam. But before then, I remember I became an Adventist in mid-90s, early 90s. I never heard an exposition or a prophetic exposition on Islam or the Mohammedans. Ellen White, it is true that there are prophecies yet to be fulfilled, but very erroneous work has been done again and again and will continue to be done by those who seek to find new light in the prophecies and who begin by turning away from what? From the light that God has already given. If God has given light, then that light remains light. It doesn't turn to darkness all of a sudden. We have a misconception that when we accept a new theory and we embrace it as truth, we call it new light. But then that means that what we had as light was not light, was darkness. New light doesn't contradict the old. What about today's books, which, which teach differently? You can go to the ABC, and I'm not bashing the ABC, but you can go to the ABC, and you can choose any book that you want on prophecy. And I can honest, honestly tell you that you will find different views on different things. There is no harmony. There is no new unity. But at one time, we were united. But God is uniting his people again here in the gathering time. Remember also, Ellen White said that new books or a new order of books will, will be what? Written. Look at this quote. General Conference Bulletin, February 13, 1895. There's a call for new books 
But the third angel's message is all brought out in the publications we now have as far as it is developed, such as Great Controversy, Patriarchs and Prophets, Bible Readings, Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation, and Two Republics. Our large books, this is written by E.R. Palmer, the missionary worker. Our large books, The Desire of Ages, Great Controversy, Patriarchs and Prophets, Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation, Bible readings, etc., are the pillars of our denominational literature. If you have these books, that's all you need. And the Bible, of course, and the Spirit of Prophecy. What does all this mean to us? As we're seeing these events right before our eyes. This tells me personally that probation, human probation, is about to close. And many of, many of us we think that there's another sign that points to the, the close of human probation. There's a danger. The Jews in the times or in the days of Christ, whether it was because of their neglect, and I'm referring to the common people, of relying on their teachers alone. The, they missed the time of their visitation. We're seeing these movements are telling us that our Lord and Savior is about to finish His work. After the and I'm not, gonna, I'm not setting any year dates, but I'm, I just want to say this. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed in 1840, Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies in 1844, four years later. We don't know when this is going to take place, but we see the movements. I often, when I talk to someone, and I say it to myself, the only reason why I'm alive now, why I am alive now, is just to develop a character like the Son of God. Amen. That's the only reason why God is sparing my days. There's no other reason. I hope that This just wasn't just information, but that it'll tell you that your Lord and Savior is very close to come. And we have been instructed. We have, I've heard very wonderful talks, wholesome spiritual food here. And if we apply it to our lives, It'll take us to conquer self, sin, and grow into the stature of Jesus Christ. Amen. I will end with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Jehovah, for the light that you have shed upon the narrow path. Thank you for bringing the old truths here right at the end of the world. Help us, dear Father, in our relationship with you. There are many things that are in the way that we need to pluck out of our heart so that you, your spirit may fill it with your presence. 
Dear Father, I pray that that the enemy will not take the seed of your word, but we can.